Hi everybody, this is Dave Cormier. I'd like to talk a little bit about the future of education from a talk I did in San Diego a couple of days ago. This is about how the term open learning is being used and how in some cases it's just a deadhead sticker on a Cadillac. So it's just innovation being put on top of a business model. And then that business model is really cool, but it's not a new sort of interesting going to the future way of learning that's supporting anything that I think is particularly important. So in order to start that conversation, to follow up on the words of the great 20th century poet Don Henley, um, and at least to contradict him, uh, we're going to look back a little bit about why people have been doing learning in the past. And I think the thing that we need to keep asking ourselves is why are we teaching? Why are we involved in this process? Why are we engaging in trying to form people or direct them or guide them? What's the purpose of this? And when you go all the way back, the purpose, when you look at a, a painting like this, the purpose is really simple. Those guys around the side there, they're all looking to get the animal in the middle because they're hungry. And it's really important to teach people how to do this so that the generations can keep on eating, so that everybody knows what their job is, so that people don't get stabbed with those giant spiky things and horns, which look really dangerous. So it's about that, right? It's about controlling the process to such a degree where we can achieve a specific goal and we all know what that goal is it's eating the other sort of major thing that they needed which is shelter probably taken care of by this rock odds are this is somewhere inside of a cave assumption on my part but anyway all the way back the way that the learning process works and what we're heading to or why we're teaching is pretty clear as you take a step forward begin to organize cultures begin into civilizations so-called um, things get a little bit more complicated this is from troy a um, guy from Troy named Aeneas wandered off to a little place, uh, bothered the Etruscans, formed a civilization called the Roman Republic, and well, Empire, Republic, Kingdom. And one of the key parts of that Republic, and a lot of things that held it together, the Roman Republic lasted for almost 500 years, was the censor. The censor, and actually there were two of them each year, uh, the censors were the people who decided how people fit into the culture. So they decided whether or not you owned enough things and you had to go in and tell the censor all the things that, that, that you owned, how many togas you had, how many kids you had, where you, the villas, all the stuff that you owned, and you had to list it out. And then they looked into all the things you'd done that year. So had you been good to your property? Had you been a noble soldier? And as long as you'd done all those things well, you could have some expectation that you would rise inside of the, the society, a very structured society, that your class would increase in some way. And if you had done badly over a, a number of years or over a number of different categories, you could expect to be demoted. These were the very central core principles of what it was to be a citizen. And in Rome, and in the Roman Republic, being a citizen was what everybody wanted to be. And that commitment to being a citizen was something that was instilled in children from a very young age. Anytime we hear about Roman children in the empire, uh, pardon me, in the Republic being taught, it's always about how to become a good Roman citizen. And that wasn't just some vague, un, sort of known, untapped concept. It was a very clearly delineated concept. So when you look at somebody like Caesar, when you look at his education, the little that we know about it, pretty much all they say is he was going to be a good citizen, a Roman citizen and statesman and a soldier. And that's what he was trained to be, you know, how to participate in the culture and how to rise up those rankings. As we move forward, as the technology changes, as our, as our culture starts to complexify, as we get more and more political parties, as that starts to split up on us, and this is uh, the printing press, which had a lot to do with some of that in order to, to really define the things that people believe. So you could have two political parties and have really clear, different printed ways of talking about what they believe. And you see that splintering of the goal of the society of what it means to be a citizen. And as we go further and we look at the technologies now, we got lots of reasons to, to, to go in different ways. And a really our knowledge and our, our, our idea of learning is splintering off. We're getting into tinier and tinier pieces. When you look at this, it's one tiny learning element about Euclid, but it's not connected to citizenry. It's not connected to the rest of our society. So the reason why we're learning it is not necessarily clear. And when you look at the concern that people have in terms of the way that this impacts the educational process, the way that this, you know, the, the thing that happened at West Virginia, where this, this, we cannot, we do not believe we can even maintain our current standard under a model of incremental marginal change. 
And in the letters back and forth between the people at the University of Virginia before they fired their president for not innovating quickly enough in response to things like massive open online courses, response to things like the Khan Academy, we see a complete lack of vision in my mind about why we're going through this learning process in the first place. And we see a place in which the business model, however important it is to keep these institutions running, maybe, starts to completely wash away the purpose for education. And we're not having the conversation about why we're learning. We have the conversation in high schools that we're learning so kids can get to university. We have a conversation inside of universities in some cases where people are saying we're teaching kids so they can get a job. But what does that mean? And, and what are the ways in which we teach and what are the things we're trying to focus on that, that get people to there? Is simply learning the stuff on the Khan Academy enough to learn someone towards getting a job? And, and there's all kinds of other technologies and ideas out there that are having the same kind of splintering effect where you, know, you can learn tiny bits of a lot of things um, in very formalized ways and get accreditation for those things without some kind of overall sense for why we're doing it. And I want to talk about two of those specifically, and I think they're they're pretty important trends in our education right now, and I think they're going to have really profound effects on what it means to learn uh, and what our society thinks it means to learn. And one of those is, is open online courses. I've been involved with, with so-called massive open online courses for about four years now. I've run six or seven of them. We've had between, I don't know, 700 and, and a couple of thousand people in them. And some people have said that the number of people is not important. It's important in one sense, at least, um, in that there's a way in which the ability to get to lots of people at the same time creates an emancipatory power that I don't think is the same as teaching 20 people. I love teaching 20 people in the classroom. It's by far my favorite way to teach. But there's something really compelling, I think, about the potential of having people engage in a learning process where they can find other people who are just like them, other people who are doing the same thing as them, other people who are in completely different circumstances, different countries, different cultural contexts, and still going through the learning process. And I think that some of those potentials are real difference makers in terms of the learning process, in terms of some of the possibilities. And we have these other more formalized MOOCs, which are really about taking the content and getting it out to maybe 150,000 people. Uh, there's talk of one right now that's looking more like 400,000 people. So they're really massive. Uh, they're open in the sense that you can register them for free. Um, and one of the things that's powering that change is this idea of analytics, right? So what you've got is the ability to be able to find out about what's going on with people, how people are interacting, what they've been doing, and how that compares to other people. So this is a really simple example. It's um, a social network analysis analytic of my Facebook account. So it starts to group people together. So just with this little piece of information, you can start to find out how the different people on my Facebook account are interrelated. Not a big leap to go from here to apply this to an educational learning management system or some other kind of environment where people are learning and trying to find out how they group together. And in this case, it's the same chart sort of spread out a little bit, the people who are not interacting. So you see that there are eight people here who are not actually connected to anybody else in that system. From an educational perspective, that again tells you something else about the learning process. So there are ways in which these analytics do really specific things and allow you to find out specific things that I think are interesting. This is the Signals Project. Um, this is um, a project that's being done at Purdue. And to sort of explain it simply, they have a, a red light, yellow light, green light system that warns students if they're falling behind other students. I encourage you to go check out on their website how they've got that structured. But it turns out that for students who are not self-selected, but selected students, so then they get selected in based on their instructor wishing to, to go ahead and select those, um, the four-year retention rate at Purdue is normally 67, 68%. Um, if that's no, 69%, if you actually are touched by the signals project. So if you were in one class where your teacher decided to use this project that gives you warnings that you're falling behind when you start to fall behind, the four year retention rate for those students automatically goes up to 87%. So it increases by 18 points simply by people being tracked in this way, having these analytics look at them, having them support their learning in a way. So 
it's taking information that we all know about. So for instance, you're falling behind, but doing the math quick enough so that it can find that out and let you know, and then get you to the services that you need to be able to, to get the help when you need it. Here's another example at Albany Technical College, almost the exact same statistics, same kind of project that tracks students and then gives them services whenever they need them, same kind of results, you know, and this stuff is happening in a lot of different places. So we've got this massiveness and this open course stuff, and we've got these, these analytics. And if you take a little bit of the open course stuff and you take a little bit of the analytics stuff, you get stuff like the combination of Udacity, which is one of these massive open online course places where it has, you know, teaches massive courses to lots of people, and Pearson, which delivers certification. So when you start working your way through that, what you've got is a school that can give 500,000 people a course based on content, and you've got a giant corporation that can certify that those 500,000 people have taken that course. Now, the business model here starts to become really interesting. The innovation from a learning perspective is not so interesting, except in the sense that the students get more flexibility and the cost is cheaper. Again, not really a learning innovation, uh, but a really amazing business innovation. And I think really this is the change that's happening in, in education right now is we've got some really fantastic business innovations happening. I concerned that these innovations are entirely premised on the idea of content being delivered outside of any context for why we're going ahead and trying to do this at all. When you look at the new project between Harvard and MIT, where they've just got $60 million in funding to work together to build one of these open online courses, um, infrastructures, they're going to build some software. When you look through their, their FAQ, it allows to give certificates of masteries to be earned by able learners. So they're going to credit this in some way. And they're trying to figure out how students learn. So if you can figure out how students learn and by learning, you mean acquire the content that's on the page in such a way that I can pass a test and you can figure out a way to identify who those students are like the Pearson testing system, then that means that you could run a course to a million people with no instructors teaching that course. So you could go in knowing how they learn. That means being able to track them, give them the best way of getting that content into their head. So students could go in, take a course, get accredited from MIT and Harvard, right? And there's no instruction cost. There's preparation cost. There's course design cost. Maybe you can throw some tutors in there if you like, but at some point we've completely changed the business model for education, not only for these schools, but if 10 million or 100 million students start taking their first year courses in this way, the business model for higher education generally is going to change. And I think there's, there's something dramatic in this change that we all have to pay attention to. And I think the response and the main response that people have is, oh, well, this isn't going to work as well and it's not really as good. It's not as good education. It's not the same quality. But again, if we don't have a clear sense of what quality is, if we don't know what we want from the education system, how can we even make this claim? Unless we're saying that the test scores are lower, which I think is a pretty thin claim for society. So the way that I look at it is this breaks down into two kinds of quality, all right? One of them is a simple quality. So does somebody understand the basic context of an industry or a field? So can they use the language that's used in that field in some kind of way that's comfortable? Um, it, do they recognize the names of the important people and generally speaking, the kinds of things they talked about, not because they need to remember those things, but if you don't have some idea of what's going on inside of an industry, you can't have a conversation with anybody. It's really tough to learn if you don't know the going language, right? So there's something about that foundational learning, that simple learning that I think is really important. Uh, it doesn't give you a clear idea of everything that's going on inside of an industry, but it gives you some kind of sense, right? And I think that that is a really, really good place for these massive open online courses. And the quality is really easy to assess. It's going to be really easy to put that automatic testing system together whereby we don't have anybody teaching courses, whereas we're just spitting this content in and we're taking it out. If that, again, is what we're looking for. And these massive open online course companies uh, like Coursera, like Udacity, like edX are going to be really effective at doing this. And 
when you get into stuff that's more complex, I think they're going to struggle. I think it's going to be a lot harder and I think it's going to come back on a lot of traditional learning um, institutions to be able to take care of that. So when you're trying to get somebody to be able to make a decision inside of a field so they know enough, they've got enough experience, enough knowledge, they've been through that process enough to be able to do that then I think the traditional learning model is going to be a good one. So like, how are you going to be able to make simple decisions? So how are you going to be able to establish best practices? Well, the Coursera stuff is through that. When you get up, we'll be good for that kind of thing. When you get up into this complex place where you have emergent challenges, when you're trying to be creative, I think they're going to struggle. But how are we going to be able to pay for those institutions without the first year courses in them? Right? So we've got a real challenge there as well, I think. What this all comes back to for me is trying to come up with a way of talking about why I teach. And I think that um, the answer to that question is, well, it ends up being a personal answer in a sense, because whereas you know, 250 years ago, Jefferson was comfortable enough to say that we're instructing the mass of our citizens and their rights and duties and interests as citizens. Right? We're still talking like the Romans. We're still talking about preparing people for this thing that we all agree about, right? And I think we can all sort of look at our cultures right now and decide that that central understanding of what that means is not something we have anymore. It's not something we're sharing right now. Um, so what I posit as the goal of education and the thing that we're trying to do, at least inside of my classes, is I'm trying to prepare my students for uncertainty. I want to put them in a position where when they're confronted with something that doesn't have a particularly good answer, where they just have to make a decision, that they're going to be able to make those kinds of decisions. They're going to have the courage to make a decision. I think a lot of it is courage. And they're going to be comfortable enough to have the experience. They're going to have an idea of what it is to fail so that they'll be prepared to make those kinds of decisions. And I call this rhizomatic learning. And I, there are other places where I've detailed this more than this, but sort of broadly speaking, the community inside of the learning process is the curriculum that we try to look at, right? Instead of talking about cheating, instead of talking about content as central to what we do, that cheating is really the sharing process. It's how we get together. It's how we, um, it's how we share the understanding of a context so that we can start a conversation. And I think the student responsibility is key. Once we put the students in the position of making decisions about what they learn, about how they learn, um, shaped inside of a structure, I mean, you need some kind of structure. The course needs a title for people to even decide to take it. Um, I think gone are the days where you can have a mentor in philosophy and that person can just carry you through. The world's probably more complex now and won't allow that. But inside of a given context, I think there is some room for that kind of freedom and for students. If they start with the responsibility inside the classroom, they're going to be able to take that responsibility outside the classroom. And the technology that we use allows for them to collaborate in ways they couldn't before. And I think there's some really valuable things there. The, it allows us to track them and then the analytics can be used to track them in those ways. And I think there's something really positive about that. Um, the content is really available for everyone. And in that sense, the sharing just makes sense. Um, there's, no sen the, there's no great value in having content in my head that somebody else doesn't because somebody else can get that content really easily. It's not like it's in a book 400 miles away. Uh, it's available, right? And it's out there. And one of the nice things about that abundance is it forces students to make decisions all the time. So if you think of the internet as your textbook, students are constantly in a position of having to make decisions about what to use and where to look and how to interpret. And those are the kinds of skills that are going to be able to push them forward. Inside the MOOC environment, um, when you get big, we talk orient, declare, network, cluster, focus. Orienting is about sort of getting a sense of what the rules are, sort of looking around inside the context. Declare is about talking about who you are and letting people know that you're, that you're there, having a space to speak from. In my classes, it's often the blog. Network is about finding other people, connecting with them, uh, giving them critical feedback, responding to the stuff that they're doing, engaging with their ideas, which allows you to cluster. You start finding people who are looking to go in the direction that you're in, people who are going to be able to help you and who you're going to be able to help, and then focus. And that's about finding a project or a goal that makes sense and pushing towards that, right? This kind of guideline prepares people for the responsibility that's attached to using the content that's part of a course and making it worthwhile and being responsible for it. 
And this creates an incredible amount of frustration. I, every one of my first courses, if you look at the feedback that comes in my own classes, there's a lot of frustration that first time where people are looking to be told what to do. They're looking for some kind of direction. They're looking for, for me to help them out in that way. And that's not something that, that I'm willing to do. I want them to get to the point where they're responsible, where they feel that responsibility that they would normally feel in their life. And I guess maybe that's the main point. Most of the things we ever learn are, in that, are, are developed in that way. There are things that we take upon ourselves to learn the way we cook, the way we you know park, drive, parallel parking a car. Those things that we normally learn are things that we learn in that way. We take responsibility for them. We slowly accumulate by, you know, sort of inside of a garden context, like, like the rhizome, right? We poke a little bit and go around that rock. And that's how we normally learn, right? We take those responsibilities. And I think that what, that's what needs to be applied to the learning process. And the technology in the grand scale allows us to do that too. It allows for those same things about collaboration and open spaces and the indefinite amount of content. But what the massive open online course, as it's done inside of... In, in the open way, in the open learning sense. It allows us to discover like-minded people and to participate in the field. So the content that we're participating in, the place that, we're, um, that we've declared from is actually engaging. It's giving back. It's potentially even affecting the way the field moves. And you end up finding people that you didn't expect, people at different institutions, people in different places that allow you to learn new and, and interesting things. So we've got one of these open online courses coming up. Uh, it's on the 8th of October on the future of education at future.net. Check it out. And just one final point. I think this is the most important thing is the technology is going to allow people to teach 500,000 people a course and accredit them automatically that nobody needs to teach it. If what we believe about learning and for purpose of learning is to get content into people's heads. If we don't decide how that technology can be used in collaborative ways, in interesting ways, in ways that allow us to be better, some things, uh, in my case, to, to be able to deal with uncertainty, then somebody else is going to do it for us. And they're going to have so much more strength of brand and so much more of an ability to figure that out that um, I think we're going to fall behind. I think there's something we need to do. Thanks.